Hello again. So in part two, I want to talk a little bit about graphing. Now, the way we graph trace elements is a little bit different than the way we treated major oxides. And you'll see this no matter what kind of data you're looking at, whether it's groundwater data or uh, igneous rocks or metamorphic rocks. When we look at trace elements, we, we do some uh, strange things. So one is we put them in this arbitrary order. Well, it's not really completely arbitrary. So a lot of times what we'll do is we'll take elements and arrange them in according to atomic radius. This is roughly atomic radius where rubidium is the largest, maybe thorium is a little bit smaller. Actually, I'm not too sure of that. These generally are big and these are generally smaller atoms. The way I've arranged this is I've actually put them in order of abundance for the upper crust. So uh, if I've done this correctly, if I take the upper crust and divide it by, um, so what I've done here in this row six, I take the upper crust and divide it by morb, I'm looking at, at its relative enrichment. So rubidium here is listed first because the upper crust, this guy here, is 29 times greater than the morb value here. So this ratio here, 29, is simply this value, upper crust blue, divided by morb in red. And then I'm just going to fill across to get all these other values. So the, the ordering here is, uh, again, thorium is put second because it has the second highest enrichment. So the crust is enriched in things like rubidium and thorium compared to mid-ocean ridge basalts, which represent the mantle. So the Earth's crust is enriched in certain elements, and it just happens to be more enriched in rubidium relative to thorium. Uh, the enrichment is 22 times for uranium, 21 times for barium, 17 times for potassium, etc. Take a look at these smaller atoms here. Vanadium has a ratio of 0.3. That means that the mid-ocean rich basalt actually has a higher concentration than the crust. So the crust is depleted in these smaller cations like vanadium and titanium and cobalt. So uh, that's the ordering here. Uh, and that's done in a lot of different kinds of situations uh, where we order things based on how we think they might be enriched or depleted in some sample that we're looking at. So this ordering here is very specific and it's ordered on this upper crust to more ratio. Let's come back to the sample. So I'm going to go to the spreadsheet, Bateman 1988, and I took this sample here. Uh, it's something with a fairly high silica, 74.66, and here are the trace elements here. Not in the same order, so if you want to take stuff from this sheet and move it over there, you're going to have to reorder those, those columns. So be careful in importing this data over into this spreadsheet, because I've put these in a different order based on that ratio. You'll have to go back and make the same ordering over here. So I want to explain this fellow that has uh, high amounts of trace elements, uh, 150 ppm rubidium, by fractional crystallization of something that is much more mafic. So down in the bottom of the spreadsheet in orange, here there's a rock with 59 weight percent silica, and relatively low amounts of rubidium, let's say 102. It's, it's low for this data set. I don't know if I've picked the, the perfect starting composition, but that's what C0 is. C0 is my starting liquid composition, and we'll use that for a uh, model for fractional crystallization. Now you might remember we looked at this sheet before for fractional crystallization, this is our Word document, modeling magmatic processes, the composition of the liquid is equal to the original composition multiplied by F, which is the melt fraction, raised to the power of D minus 1, where D is the bulk distribution coefficient. So when we did these calculations before, we just let D be any old number to try to fit the data as well as we could. We're going to go into a little bit more detail this time. That bulk distribution coefficient is shown here. These values, let's take a look at rubidium. The bulk D for rubidium is 0.04, but it is a weighted average of these different values for the individual mineral melt partition coefficients here. So these are 
mineral melt partition coefficients. So for olivine, it's got a very low partition coefficient, 0 0.003. But if you take a look at amphibole, it's got a coefficient of 0 0.2. They're all incompatible, but in olivine, rubidium is strongly incompatible. In an amphibole, it's only slightly incompatible. So we get a value of 0 0.04 by taking a weighted average of all these coefficients multiplied by this group of numbers here, which are the weight fraction of minerals that we think are forming in this liquid. So for our starting liquid, we think that it's going to precipitate 45% olivine, 25% CPX, 10%, uh, oh, I said that backwards, 25% OPX, 10% clinopyroxene, etc. And all of these things should sum to one. Now, you're not going to touch any of these numbers here. These are all from experiments and they're all fixed. But you can adjust these numbers here. Maybe we think there's no olivine at all in the system. Notice that the sum now dropped to 0.55. We can bump up the proportion of plagioclase to 0.55, and we'd have a very different set of bulk D. So now notice that the bulk D for rubidium is instead of 0.4, now it's 0.175. It's something very different. So we're going to change the bulk distribution coefficients by trying to guess at the kinds of minerals that are forming from a given liquid. So to finish that off, I've got a starting liquid composition here. Uh, I'm going to have a value for F. So I need some uh, an estimate for melt fraction. The melt fraction will start at 1 and will go in increments of 0.1 from 0.1 down to... Well, we could go to 0, but this equation here, it's going to blow up when F goes to 0. So instead of 0, I'll make it 0 0.001 and we'll see what happens. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to enter this equation here into the spreadsheet. So I'll, uh, to make sure things are properly labeled, I'm going to copy the elements so I can keep track of what elements we're calculating. This is concentration in uh, liquid. Make that font a little bit larger. Okay, so if we want to cal calculate the concentration in some theoretical liquid after fractional crystallization, we take the original composition C0, so this will be equal to C0, that's my starting composition, multiplied by F, there's F over here, raised to the value in parentheses of the bulk distribution coefficient right here in green, minus one. We'll close the parentheses and then we have an estimate. We'll just make that in a larger font, 14. Well, if the liquid is 100% of the system, then I have no crystallization at all, and this is kind of a nice test. I should be able to get back the original liquid composition. I want to be able to fill down and fill right with the um, value here in red, C27, that's F. I want to be able to change the rows, but I don't want the column to change, so I'll put a dollar in front of the C. For D23, that's the original composition, I want, when I fill down, I don't want the row to change, but I do want the columns to change, so I can fill right and look at the calculation for other elements. And then for the bulk distribution coefficient, it's the same. I want to fill down using the same row, but I want the, the columns to adjust. And so when I fill right, notice that I'm reproducing the initial composition here, and then if we fill down, we'll get our evolved compositions. So what we're trying to ask is this. If we have this as a starting composition, can we reproduce this sample from the TIC up here in green, which has about 150 ppm rubidium? And notice that we do when F is about 0.6. It looks like between 0.6 and 0.7, we would hit 150 ppm um, pretty closely. 
So perhaps we've got the right model. Let me just fill right. So that's how we're going to do the calculations. Um, but we have to explain not just rubidium, and this is, this is why trace elements are so powerful. We want to explain thorium and uranium and barium, and we have to do it using the same model. So notice that uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to do a goal search. So data, let's see. What, what I want to do is I want rubidium to be 150 ppm. So for tools, goal seek. I want to set this value to be exactly 150, and I'm going to do it by changing this cell here, which is the melt fraction. So what melt fraction would I get? 62.6%. Uh, and that explains the rubidium perfectly. But does this melt fraction also explain thorium? The thorium in this sample was 19. Here it's 25.9. So it's not really a very good fit. How about uranium? This is about 10 for the calculated value, but the observed value is 2.6. So notice that it fit, we got a good agreement for rubidium, but we'd have to go to other melt fractions to explain some of these other elements. Well, what we want to do is try to find either a different starting liquid or using the same starting liquid, use different mineral proportions to try to get all of the elements to fit as closely as possible. None of them might fit perfectly, but we want to try to explain all of these elements as close as we can using a single starting liquid, a single set of distribution coefficients, and a single set of minerals. And so when we come back, uh, we're going to take a look at how we can graph this and then use that graph to try to come up with a good model.